I was going through a heartbreak and I decided to get myself some revenge nails. So I'm in the basement floor of this nail salon in Paris. The pink and orange paint on the floor reminds me of the Parisian sunset and it, smelled, it smells all sorts of chemicals for gel nails and I'm trying to pick the best colors and rhinestones for my revenge nail set design. And I'm also talking to people there. Atanasia, who is the owner of the salon, asks me what I do for a living. I get icky every time I get this question because I think we're either going to start talking about killer robots, science fiction, or nobody's actually going to care. So I tell her I research, write, and talk about the social implications of artificial intelligence technologies. And her eyes sparkle with excitement, and she tells me, oh, then can you explain me why the Instagram algorithm doesn't show some of my photos to most of my followers? I hesitate a little bit because I don't know. And I tell her, try to make Insta Reels, maybe? And we were both dissatisfied with my answer that day. But we had a great conversation. So when I was going towards home, I said, I need to know better. And I literally Googled how Instagram algorithm works. And on the first pages of my search, I came, through, came across this article by an Instagram engineer written in 2019 that was explaining the different sorts of algorithms that the recommendation algorithms for the For You page actually was using. I understood the logic, but it was still not precise enough for me to answer Athanasia's or others like Athanasia's questions. So I started investigating. I started looking at my For You page. Do you know the page that I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. So my For You page gives me um, Kim Kardashian, uh, Bella Hadid, lots of nails, fitness, weight loss, and stuff like that. And I don't know if this is the image of myself that I want to project here today, but let's be honest, right? So, um, the problem is that we don't know how these systems work and how they qualify and categorize us based on the data. And when we ask about, so where the data come from, every time you're on social media, you're like, you're liking, clicking, sharing something, producing content, or interacting with some content, this becomes the information that is registered about you, your devices, your age group, your location, and many more things. And you don't even have to be on social media. Every time you are browsing the web, uh, do you remember this little pop-up window with cookies, either accept or refuse, and most of the time you cannot find the refuse part? Uh, your information uh, with cookies sent to most of the time to Facebook or now Meta, Amazon, Apple, Google, and really like many other few technology companies, their partners and third parties. And then all this information can be repackaged and sold to anybody basically and legally uh, through data brokers. And, and the buyers of this information includes government agencies, um, advertisement companies, credit rating agencies, insurance, you name it. And with all this information, what they do is actually they create a social graph or a profile upon which it's really not hard to predict, what, predict one's sexuality, religion, or political beliefs in a quite accurate way. And although we say that the data is anonymized, it is actually possible to trace the information back to the person with that level of specificity and that amount of data. So um, we might be a little bit familiar with the question of privacy on the internet, and maybe this has become a sort of anxiety that we know how to live with now. Or we may even think that I have nothing to hide, or it makes sense for me that I'm using these services for free, so they take away my data. Or we may even think that, okay, what does my personal choice have to do with things of such big scale? 
Well, because all of this is happening on a private infrastructure captured by a handful of companies, it is really impossible, it is very difficult for us to know the inner workings of these systems because they are protected by intellectual property laws and corporate secrecy. And we can't actually easily understand the apps that we're spending hours on. And at the same time, we are targeted by powerful algorithms all the time. And these methods are already being used not only for marketing purposes, but also to pre predict social outcomes, like really important life situations. For example, let's say you applied for a job and you're passing a video interview, which has become something very co uh, common since the COVID pandemic, right? Uh, an AI tool can be used actually to understand, to detect your emotions and build a profile, psychological profile for you and to understand if you are suitable for the position that you're applying for. Or your children's grades can be predicted with AI tools. And it has been the case in the UK last year. Or even in criminal justice settings, AI tools has been used to predict a criminal defendant's likelihood to commit a crime. So the government agencies and private companies uh, want to cut costs, save money, right, increase efficiency. But what the algorithms do is really not really magic. Uh, what researcher Abeba Birane says is that Algorithms actually pick up on patterns and correlations in large amounts of data, but without real understanding or causality. So what data is, it's a representation and actually a flattening of the past. So these systems learn based on the past. An example to understand this is um, the, the example of Amazon. In 2018, it was revealed that Amazon was using was developing an AI tool to help them with hiring. Uh, since the, they were receiving lots, lots of CVs, it was very time consuming for the recruiters to go through them one by one. And they wanted the AI tool to pick the top talent in this large pool of candidates. And they would only interview tho those people selected by the tool. But what ended up happening is that the tool the AI tool, chose far more men than women. So was it because men were in general more qualified than women, or the tool was biased against women? The answer is the second. Uh, because they understood that the system was actually downgrading CVs of people who were graduated from women's colleges, and downgrading also the word woman as in women's chess team and things like that. So uh, the company stopped using the tool, but this is not maybe the main point here because this is a very well known example of algorithmic harm and it, was been, it has been actually also picked by the media a lot. But even though we know this example and we're talking about Amazon and not a big, not a small startup but a company that has all the resources and abilities to make these systems work. Um, a report by Harvard Business School states that 99% of Fortune 500 companies in the US are using automated software for hiring. And that millions of people cannot even get their foods inside, not because they're unqualified, but because they're automatically rejected by the software tool based on bad or insufficient criteria. Like for example, if they have a gap in, in their CVs, let's say it's a woman who had a child and had to have a gap in their CV. Um, so we may think that actually bias or sexism in hiring is not something new. And actually algorithmic harm doesn't only happen on the basis of gender, but also race, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, uh, ability, and you name it. But the problem here is like what Atanasia was saying, we can't really understand immediately if we or another person are being subjected to a situation of automated injustice. 
and we can't easily interact and even hold these systems into account because we don't even understand very easily who is responsible for this because it's complex. So my intention is not to make you feel powerless or overwhelmed because we've been talking about all the bad things that humans were doing today, but also alongside very good things also. Um, and I know how it feels to feel powerful because when I first uh, moved to France from Turkey, I had to confront the perception that people had about me based on things like my appearance, my accent, and where I was coming from. And I realized that there was this gap, actually, between how people were perceiving me, based on my perception again, and how, who I thought I was or what I was capable of. And today I know that that's not my truth, but it took me a lot of work and it's not something that you can do alone. And this gap is actually way bigger for people who have been pushed to the margins of the society historically. So, is refusing the cookies enough? It's not. Um, as technology goes up to the space, to Mars, infinitely far away, I think it's important that we go also deep down in ourselves and understand, you know, how identities, labels, categories work and how they are used to assign power across society. How, might, how we might be advantaged and disadvantaged by them. And having this space, as the previous um, Th Thomas was saying, with the quote of Viktor Frankl, having this space also helps us cultivate some compassion for ourselves and others and stand in solidar solidarity with others who might, who might be experiencing tough things. What I want to ask you to do after this talk is to just pick up your phone and look at your For You page on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, or your social media of preference and think about what does it say of me? What does it reflect about me? And really, you know, critically engage with it and understand if you're comfortable with this and what we understand so that we can acquire algorithmic literacy and understand when we are being subjected to algorithmic harms or somebody else is being subjected in order to pursue a systemic solution altogether. Um, so going back to the nail salon, I wasn't only happy because I had my revenge nails, but because also what Atanasia told me. She told me that go and told there being a woman looking like this with extra pink nails and just show that you can also talk about technology and systemic injustices. And this has been my passion for the at least last four years. And that's why we co-founded with Nushin Yazdani Dreaming Beyond AI, which is a research advocacy and art platform around the questions um, of artificial intelligence and their social impact. Surprisingly or not, my Instagram algorithm, algorithm has still not picked up on my passion. And I think um, in that we are all still beyond the algorithm. Thank you.